established in January of 1919. Okay? The occupation of the Ruhr, the Germans could not pay back the war reparations. It basically, France went back in, um, and all the other Allied governments, also militaries, went in. 25, the Gestapo, and then the Civil War in, uh, in Spain, occupation of Czech Republic, and then September 1st, 1939, the war officially kicks off in Europe. Rule of law. Okay, this is really interesting. Here we go, I love this one. Uh, so the Nazis took over in uh, March uh, 1933. Law against overcrowding in schools and university. Well, who's not against overcrowding? Does anyone have an idea who this targets? Exactly. So a lot of times they say these laws, and really they're hinting for something else. All right? Removal um, of, here's a few, uh, one of them, uh, saying they can't be Germans anymore. They can't be involved in the arts. Jews cannot be involved. The army law, no, no Jews in the army. All right? The, uh, the blood honor, that piece, Jewish teachers are banned. Then all of a sudden start going after the cultural property. That's what they went after, right? And Hitler, a uh, confiscation order. This is even before the final solution was identified and written out in a word. Governance. The key thing here is the fire, the Reichstag fire. Because a month or so later, the Enabling Act, that basically said, hey, the Reichstag does not count, the legislative branch, and now Hitler is basically effectively a, a dictator. 38, the purge of degenerate art. Economics. We complain about inflation right now. One dollar, US dollar equal to 4.2 trillion right marks. Unemployment rate, you can track the German people joining the Nazi party based off of the rise and fall of the unemployment rate in Germany. When the stock markets crashed, all the banks that were applying, providing money to Germany to help repay back what the cost of World War I, that had stopped, okay? And basically, we kind of hit the point, 1933. And then economics-wise, the boycott of Jewish businesses, which only went, you know, a few days. But then at that point, Jews were isolated in Germany, and they were in a real tough line. So the military piece again. Here's a trivia question, all right? We've got a hard crowd here, museum crowd. Look at these dates. When do you think, because the world was watching, when do you think that the Louvre in Paris started evacuating material out of the Louvre in Paris? Could someone guess a year, an event? Twenty-five. Yeah, yeah, maybe some people were really watching. Uh, real, real quick. People outside of Germany were reading Mein Kampf before people inside Germany. Nineteen twenty-three. Yeah. Like your guess is here. Whoa. Because the um, Condor Legion, which was the uh, Luftwaffe uh, group um, that went into um, Spain to help the fascist government out is when they indiscriminately bombed the cities. So it was 1938 that they slowly started pulling material out of the Louvre, all right? Not until really August of 39 that the building was vacated. Okay. Where did it go? It went to like chateaus. The Germans, when they did occupy France, they knew where all the material was. The thing was, it was French government material, so they didn't go after it. They were going after Aryanization, removal of Jewish cultural property. They were staying in France? Staying in France, most of it, yes. But it was the majority of it. All right, so the Mona Lisa was under some girl's bed. Chateau, a wealthy family, right? The money has been had nothing to do with that. All right, so you have here Joseph Sachs with the American Defense Harvard Group. They are starting to observe what was happening. You had the Roberts Commission, First commission was because of what happened at Pearl Harbor. How was that such a mistake that was identified that we're going to be attacked? The second commission got into uh, looking at um, cultural property. 43, the monuments men and women were, were established. And then 43, 44, the deployment starts taking place with uh, operations 
in southern and also in northern Europe. Uh, here's uh, General Marshall and General Eisenhower. And Eisenhower said, as soon as I can get rid of, rid of the civil affairs issues and military governance, my life will become a lot easier. <laughs> Each week dealing with this is taking 10 years off my life. That's what I said. And it's how the military thinks now. Real, we're really good at winning battles like no one's business. We are really bad at doing civil affairs. Okay? So they knew this back then, but what they did is they said, hey, we need to start establishing connections with universities and get this expertise going. Not just training soldiers, but also experts. A lot of this discussion, let's see what next slide, okay. Here I'm quoting the, um, uh, when the Monuments Men and Women were established. Uh, this is out of the official histories of the US Army, the Green Books. And there's a volume on civil affairs. And there's a chapter called Soldiers Become Governors. The, what I've been dealing with and the job that, the responsibility I've been given, the emails that I have are eerily similar to the emails in the history books because senior leaders were like, we don't really need this and we don't really want this capability. This is not gonna be our problem. But then other groups are like, no, you need to do it. And you need, the, you need universities, you need civilian organizations to help out. And we've had the same exact discussion of like, no, no, we can do this on our own. Well, that ain't the case. Here are some famous monuments, men and women. Um, Lieutenant Hyde here, um, out, of, uh, out of Amarillo, Texas. Okay, so happy to say. George Stout, okay, so that was George Clooney's character. Matt Damon's character, Lieutenant Romer. Okay, sorry. <laughs> You've seen the movie, okay. Um, uh, Lincoln uh, Kirsten, he was a private in the Army, but he's the one who established the New York City Ballet in the Lincoln Center. Okay? If you have 16 million people mobilized, you're going to have a real the depth and breadth of society. Our force is not like that now. We are a fighting force, and that's what we're really good at. We're a really professional force, but we're a volunteer force, so you're not going to have the mix of everybody. And this is the quality that's brought in when everyone's behind the war effort, as long as it's a just war. Okay, so I'd like to highlight this letter from General Eisenhower to his commanders, and this took place during the Italian campaign where thousands were dying that day. Very bloody campaign. And he says here, you can't read it, I'm sorry, I apologize. If we have to, this is called, this summary, his summary, uh, historical monuments, December 1943, all right? Although it's before D-Day, there's heavy fighting in Italy. If we have to choose between destroying a famous building and sacrificing our men, then our men's lives count infinitely more and the buildings must go. And then I love this part. But the phrase military necessity is sometimes used where it would be more truthful to speak military convenience or even personal convenience. I do not want it to cloak slackness or indifference. This is heavy kinetic fighting. And in the recent wars that we have fought in, Iraq and Afghanistan were not as kinetic as this was. It's yet he's still saying how important it is. All right? So you have um, from North Africa pushed through Sicily. And right here, this lower, this is a very slow push, Anzio, all up to Rome. Um, the connection between my family is my grandfather was born on the eastern side of Italy. All right, he came to the United States in 1922, enlisted in the Army in the 1930s, became an officer when the war broke out, and became a military governance officer. But he could speak Italian. He knew the area. He knew about electricity, so they sent him in. So there's a little bit of generational connection here. Normandy, the push of the monuments men initially met up towards Brittany, in, here in Normandy area, and then moved, and they all, it's, it's, if you've read the books, Monuments Men, and also Saving Italy, it's the civil fair stories to me, because they had no resources to get around, to find this type of work. They basically had a bank bar on steel, and they're slowly, you know, trying to push behind the front as it moves forward. But every time they showed up to a battle space, they're like, what are you, you know, the commanders are like, what are you doing here, you know, move on, or you can't come with us. So they really had to scam their way through, for lack of a better phrase. Oh, there's the Mona Lisa. We had nothing to do with that, sorry. Again, altarpiece of Madonna Bruges, Michelangelo. All right, and here's a 
approximate area where the, uh, the salt mines were. All right, so I'm going to touch, I'm going to breeze right through military governance here. Okay, so this is the idea of what the heritage and preservations fall under. And it's a new area of concentration that was established in 2014. Um, 38 Gulf, 38 G, military governance specialist. Um, that's what I am. And there's 18 jobs, skill identifiers that fall under it. And, you know, it's out of, you know, Fort Bragg, special operations. And there's only one command that we fall under, and that's under the U.S. Army Civil Affairs and Psychological Operations Command. It's a mouthful. So from now on, I'll only say use a cape puck. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So why? All right? Because of the Geneva and Hague Convention. And it was identified that how badly we messed up Iraq and Afghanistan. And somehow, I don't know what leader thought this up, but my hat's off to that person. He said, um, we can deal in deception, but we can't deal in self-deception. And we owe it to ourselves to get it right. And to the American people and to the people we're, we're serving with. When someone says, hey, uh, hey uh, thank you for serving, I, I, my response is I'm honored to serve. Because it's the taxpayers like you all that fund this capable force and be able to defend this nation. All right, so we got to take our, our business serious. And if we have to do military governance, which we have done for every single war, we do it all the time, although the Army forgets. So basically, the head convention. All right, so we want to develop, deliver capabilities and transitional military authority. We want to work our way to a job as fast as possible, not sit there for 20 years. Here are all the skill identifiers on 38 Gulf. All right, so it's under economics, government, rule of law, public and social services, and here I am. Okay, so archivists as well. I'll come back to this. All right, now it's going to get tough because I'm going to explain to you what what we're really going after here in a lot of ways to support DOD and the real way of protecting cultural property with our partner nations through strategic competition. Okay, so the idea is that we have partner nations that we work with. And there's us. And they, they want a certain thing, and we say, no, we're not going to give it to you. But you have Russia and China offering it up as well. Who's to say they want to stay with us? That threshold of tolerance. Okay? And what's applied are, mil are variables. And we do operations, activities, and investments along political, military, economic, social, infrastructure, and information. And so are our adversaries. So if they have a high tolerance for us and they want to stay with the United States, this line moves up and our adversaries cannot operate. But if this line gets pushed down, we can't operate and we lose out on strategic competition. And all our adversaries are using cultural heritage. Russia did positive programs on eastern Ukraine, like showing that, oh, it's, well, we're here for you. Really, they, what they did is they Russified Ukraine churches, and they're doing it in the Balkans. They're like, oh, look at this church. It has a lovely new paint job. Yeah, they erased the, the imagery that was in that church before. And if you're driving through that town, you're like, oh, that's a lovely paint job. But no, 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 the Russians are actively going in, and it looks like positive. But then the war kicked off. They started destroying things, right? So they're, they're looking at this, but the U.S. has not been. We avoid culture. The military avoids culture. Politics and religion. That's usually what wars are fought over. <laughs> Sorry. All right, so normally the DOD would go, all right, so we have link analysis. We have groups connected to the government. But what about cultural heritage? How it's interconnected? That's, that's, that's normally not looked at. So here's tangible and intangible, the intangible symbol right here. This is what our competitors are doing, OK? Poland, Russia, cross-border cooperation, 2020, okay? Now, they're not pleased with each other. Ukraine's cultural revival is a matter of national security against Russian soft power. China in, uh, in Africa, teaching Kung Fu. China with the EU on cultural heritage. They lead, and you'll see, there's a whole, we just gave a presentation at West Point relating with Iran. The first, in China and Russia, the first thing they lead with is a cultural memorandum of understanding. And then they come in with economics. Uh, if you've heard of the One Belt, One Road Initiative, okay? 
this is a lot. I mean, a lot of stuff's been happening this year. It's all open source. This is nothing, nothing hidden here. The reason why I focus on Iran here is because that was a research question we were given. We're like, what's Iran doing with cultural heritage? Iran, Venezuela. Okay, they're, you know, how, how, how are they connected? But they are, they're fighting routes. Belarus. Vietnam is not really pro China. The idea of the charm offensive because of South China Sea. All right, so obviously our competitors are doing something related to it. Then you also have illicit trafficking taking place, threatening cultural heritage. Sometimes it's connected to the government where we're operating in. They're part of the problem. And there's these connections. And what we do as heritage preservation officers is explore these connections. And a lot of times it's routed through cultural heritage. That's how they're interacting with each other. Either stealing it or destroying it or promoting one side as a power ideology. This is kind of a complicated model, but the idea is that we're focusing on the edge right now when we start talking about what's happening in these relationships. The, the operational variables, what's the motives, and what the availability they have and the uh, resources to do these things. And it happens to the relationships between the different actors. And all of a sudden we start figuring out, like, oh, that one country is our friend, well, really, they're not because they're connected more economically and culturally to, the, to our competitors. And so we can figure out where we fit in the world, whether we can actually, if there's a time for defense, whether these people will stand by with us or they're true partners. And what is the U.S. doing? Eh, not much. All right. So the idea is like there's all these hot spots going on and these, these variables are affecting things. So we're redefining the operational approach for the military, the idea of knowing where we are. Through cultural heritage, we can say, all right, you know, we can define the idea of social well-being and rule of law um, using uh, actually intelligent assets and open sources to identify where we sit. We can also define the type of conflict it is through culture to know what we need to do to help uh, for reconciliation processes. The willingness of a, of a nation to protect the culture of all. It's like, okay, so, you know, if, if I'm a Methodist and it's a Protestant church or whatever, like, do I, it's from 1850, am I willing to go in that church? It's like, oh, this is part of my community's history. Or it's like, no, I can't, I don't want to, I can't deal with them. You know, do they, do they care about the minority group? And now we'll tell, it's like, are they going to head towards a peaceful solution? The opportunities, you know, who the greater understanding of the conflict, Violent extremist organizations, transnational criminal organizations, what they're up to, what the adversaries are targeting. From all this, putting cultural heritage down on the environment, we can actually redefine the end states and objectives. So with military necessity, normally, um, uh, you know, example, like if in Iraq, and you would see, there would be a mosque, and there would be some you know, insurgents with RPGs. Normally, what's the army? We're, we're a hammer, and everything we see is a nail. We see those with the RPGs, like, let's hit them now while we can see them. Instead of, like, let them pass and move on, and we'll get them as they go down the road. Do not strike near the mosque. Because they would go, well, military necessity means we get it. We have to get them. No, you've actually reversed the definition, because under current doctrine, military necessity is what you need to do to end the war as quick as possible. If you blow up that mosque, you think the war is going to end sooner? No, it's going to get prolonged. Because the insurgents are going to look what they did. The evil West. Right? So it's actually reversed why you cannot destroy cultural property. And the argument we're making with, with our leaders and discussing with them is that it's a military necessity to protect the cultural heritage of the places where the, of the people that we work with and partner with for security. So here, if we took the 1954 Hague Convention. Article 7, military measures, and we reverse this model where we say, you know what, that country needs more than what they have. Do they have monuments, men and women? So this is where we can come in and go, we're going to give you the capability, because if they're a signatory of the 1954 Hague Convention, the 
protection of cultural property and armed conflict, and they're a small military, we send our heritage preservation officers to go provide them with that support. And the idea now, we're saying, hey, we want to give you more than what you think you have. Well, you have our adversaries doing stuff, but guess what? Now, we're actually on the side. You can't surge trust when a war is about to break out. The idea is for good, helping that nation, that partner nation, excuse me, AOR, uh, area of responsibility, the countries around the world, okay? What we do is we say, we're going to make you the monuments men and women of your own culture. We are here to help, but you're the ones who are going to do it, and we build trust. And then also, we increase sharing of information, because a lot of times, I've been at secure, uh, strategic commands, and we'll be given a briefing, we have our partners with us in the, you know, different countries, we say, oh, we gotta, we're going to elevate the security clearance of this briefing, sorry, all our partners got to get out of the room. What kind of message is that? And then they leave the room, and I'm like, I'm amazed to find out, 